OK, um, let's uh, let's make a let's make a start there. Um, so um, after some uh, slightly confusing arrangements and, and rearrangements, uh, welcome everybody to this uh, physics research uh, seminar, um, which is very kindly being given uh, for us uh, by Dr. Lorenzo Piccinani from Imperial College in London. Uh, Lorenzo is uh, the reader in audio experience design uh, at Imperial, uh, where he leads a group working in well, various aspects of uh, spatial audio, virtual reality, auditory perception, and lots of interest applications. Um, it's like whack a mouth for this. Uh, Right, um, so uh, without without further ado, uh, over to you, Lorenzo. Great, thanks Bill for the introduction and thanks for the invite. And again, sorry that I'm not able to be there in person with you. I really was looking forward to this, but again, it will be another time. So um, about this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about our team, but, but specifically the first part I'm going to talk is about virtual reality and hearing science. This was a keynote presentation that I gave at the at the VCCA conference before the summer. So I'm going to basically redo that slightly updated. Uh, but then I, I also put uh, a lot of material in this presentation that are I, I, I checked now for the first time. There are 56 slides. Uh, obviously, I don't want, mean to run through all of them, but I've put a few things at the end and maybe uh, we can see what you might be more interested in. I can tell you something about each of them and then you tell me if you are interested in hearing more about some of them or not. Uh, at the same time, anything you hear, I mean, if you're interested in anything you hear, please, by all means, do visit us at Imperial College and we'll be very happy, A, to measure your HRTF. We have our new setup here that you can see uh, and uh, B, to have a chat about also some other projects that we do. So uh, first thing, um, well, the team that that uh, I coordinate here is called Audio Experience Design. We have a very nice new website and here is just a, a very broad overview of what we do. The first thing we, we, we work in trying to understand uh, spatial hearing mechanisms and try to measurement, uh, measure them from, from, from people. So how do we perceive space? How do we perceive reverberation? Try to really understand these elements in order to be able to better design and develop tools and numerical approaches to uh, spatial audio, which could include specialization tools, could include um, HRTF selection and, and synthesis tools and et cetera. So these two aspects are the core parts of the team. So understanding human perception and with this understanding, develop tools that can be used. Uh, and finally, we also work a lot on applications. So we look at, at, uh, at well, practically applying practical life uh, our research here, there are some examples. The 3D tuning project was a project we did ages ago, looking at, well, ages, probably five, six years ago, looking at virtual reality for hearing aid users. We have, this is the only product we have sort of released is a bug, is, is, is an autonomous recorder that can be attached to trees and will record and stream audio in real time. You can't, I mean, we have a proper website. You can't really buy them unless you buy a hundred of them. We don't really have the, the possibility of sending, selling a few units, but it was our first attempt to get something out. Then we worked in interfaces for blind people. Uh, we worked, actually, we, we are part of a team with Abbey Road Studios looking at how special audio techniques and technologies can be used in audio production. And we work also on projects with uh, an IHR looking at, uh, for example, cochlear implant teenagers and, and teaching them how to use uh, both um, implants together for performing like any any everyday task. Anyway, this is just an overview, but let's move on on the on the specific topic of the talk. And so why virtual reality? So here we're talking about using VR for hearing research, both in, in research settings and clinical settings. Well, virtual reality has got two big advantages. The first one over standard methods. The first one is very close to real life. Sometimes we refer to this as being ecologically valid. We can all agree that the, the standard audiological tests that you would do in a clinic, which is pure tonal geometry and maybe speech geometry, are not really um, what you would encounter or expect in real life. You never, you never are in silence trying to detect a sound, and well, very rarely. And uh, if you are in a, uh, trying to understand speech, this happens probably, very probably, in a space where you have 
a lot of uh, reverberation probably you have a lot of other people speaking not just white noises all around you so virtual reality could potentially be allow to get to a much closer level of realism in our assessment and at the same time is highly controllable especially if headphone based in the sense that if you if you if you do uh, your test with headphones you can really carefully control whatever is received at the entrance of the ear canal. Also with loudspeakers, you can reach that level of control, but you have more variability related to the room, the position of the user and etc. And controllability is very important because if we want on a balance, we have on one side realism and on the other side controllability. The tests we carry out normally in clinic are very controllable, but not very realistic. Real life is realistic by definition but it's not very controllable. We couldn't really do some tests in real life because yeah, it would be difficult to control the precise SPL of the ear can drum, be difficult to replicate the, 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 exactly the same scene and et cetera. And so virtual reality could allow us to do these two things at the same time, which is very powerful. And we can use then these to do things such as assessing hearing to demonstrate for example, new hearing technologies, new hearing aid, to train hearing skills, as we will see later, to personalize uh, devices like, again, uh, personalize the fitting of a hearing aid beyond the standard uh, sort of um, uh, amplification, uh, but also personalize some of the other functionalities and also explore new functionalities and new paradigms and techniques. So virtual reality has got a lot of potential. Uh, what do we have now that we didn't have before? Virtual reality has been around for a while. Well, in the late recent, let's say, five years, we, we had many, many advances um, that make virtual reality more interesting now than before. But the first one is portability and price. Um, five years ago, we had to buy an Oculus Rift uh, that needed a, a computer, a powerful computer with a powerful graphic card for a cost of three, four thousand pounds. And actually, yeah, we needed to install two antennas in the space and et cetera. Nowadays, you can do this using an Oculus Quest or, or a Pico or other similar devices that are self-contained devices that cost a few hundred pounds. And they do everything from the tracking to the rendering, everything on board. Um, the performances, of course, of these devices is higher. I'm not saying that an, a Quest 2 now is a uh, better performance than what was a Rift five years ago is not true. But at the same time, uh, performances are very high. I mean, now for most of the auditory task, auditory related tasks, a Quest can perform everything in the self-contained um, processor so without requiring any external additional uh, renderer. Um, of course, if you want to do very special or visual rendering and very, very complex interactive scenes, it might be difficult, but they're very, very powerful and again, portable and relatively cheap. And they allow for a high level of personalization and customization because most of these um, platforms, uh, hardware platform allow you to, to program in uh, uh, different environments. Uh, well, in our case, we use a lot Unity or Unreal. Uh, and, and within these platforms, you can basically customize everything you want. You can, uh, you can customize a lot of aspects apart for the, for the fitting of the, of the actual hardware device on the head. So they're very uh, customizable for any possible use, which is very positive. So, it is a good moment now to start looking at this. And obviously we are not the first having done this. Many people have done it. And so here is just a, very, a list uh, that doesn't aim to be exhaustive of some of the past projects that have looked at this in the past, validating and, 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 and contributing to, to, to foster the use of these uh, techniques of virtual reality in hearing science. Well, the first that I cite here is some work from uh, uh, the Dow Group, the Thorsten Dow Group, where they look at comparing a real life and virtual acoustic with multi loudspeaker system. And in this case, they evaluated a speech task and they looked also at a beamformer on the hearing aid. So this is typically something that you can do only with loudspeakers and not with headphones. Um, and, and they validated virtual reality as a suitable alternative in the sense that the performances of the beamformers and of the speech reception were similar comparing the virtual acoustics and uh, the real life scenarios. Uh, here is another work from the same team, and in this case, uh, they compared actually standard uh, headphone-based speech geometry as the one that we do in in clinics. And in this case, again, it's a very simple test where you generally have 
Uh, you might have a noise in one ear or in the other or in both, and you might have a speech signal in one ear or the other or in both. No environmental simulation, uh, no acoustics of the space and, and no variability, and, and, and the noise is just basically an energetic mask. And even in this case, they did validate the results and they saw that the virtual reality version was comparable with the results you got with a speech, uh, and at the same time allowed for a much higher level of realism, therefore for a potential of modifying the scene much more and getting it closer as much as possible to reality if compared with the standard speech geometry. This is uh, some uh, interesting work for, uh, from the Oldenburg group here, uh, where they looked at um, identify the factors that affect hearing aid performance across different tested environments. And in this case, they, they, they compared uh, a lab uh, environment, a typical like a geology clinic environment versus a virtual acoustics environment with much more accurate simulations of the space. And uh, in this case, so they evaluate the, 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 the performance of several functions of the hearing aid. And even in this case, actually in this case, they found significant differences between how the hearing aid performed uh, because in the lab, the scene was definitely that whatever was recreated was definitely not uh, very realistic, was very controlled and very simplified, and the hearing aid performed in a certain way. While in a virtual acoustic scenario, the hearing aid performed much closely to what they previously measured in real life. Therefore, when assessing uh, hearing aid performances using virtual acoustic is a potential to get a more realistic and a more uh, a more reliable outcome if what we're looking at is to see how hearing aids behave in real life. Other studies here again from, from Torsten Group looking at uh, how um, localization can be affected by the visuals and by the head mounted display. And then another work from, from a similar team in this case was we're looking at modeling speech intelligibility uh, using virtual environments, loudspeaker rendered and uh, uh, real lab environment. And even in this case, they validated their measurements. Um, Bernard Sieber, for example, did some very early work on using um, on using um, virtual reality very early, even when he was before here in the UK in Nottingham and now he's in Munich. But recently actually released uh, a set of data sets for uh, audiovisual um, virtual reality uh, of content for audiovisual virtual reality. This is an example of an underground station. They released a lot of data that can be used to simulate this. And this is an extremely important aspect of this domain of virtual reality um, for, for hearing assessment is that in order for it to be usable and used, we obviously need a large amount of content and we need a certain amount of standardization and tools. So Bernard Sieber is one of the, the, the people that has released a large amount of content for these. And obviously uh, then there are other um, uh, people that have released, for example, tools like the groups of Janina Fels in Aachen has released some tools for, um, for uh, well, in this case, is a mobile laboratory for on-site listening experiments in virtual and acoustic environment. Uh, and etc. So there are a lot of tools and a lot of, of, of content now widely available and there is a good amount of research that has shown and validated some measurements between clinic, lab, virtual reality and, and simulated environments and real life. Again, this doesn't mean to be an, ex, uh, an extensive and uh, complete list, but it's just some example of past works that have been done. And now I'd like to focus more on the work we did. So I present some of the work we have carried out in this direction. And the first bit is going to look at hearing assessment. So how can we use virtual reality to assess certain hearing functions? And in this case, I'm going to talk about a test we did recently. There is a test called Spatial Speech in Noise, which was actually uh, first presented by uh, Jenny uh, Bisley in, at UCL in 2014 or 15. I don't remember precisely. This is a dual task paradigm. So uh, how it works is you have several loudspeakers in front of you. You have this system that is called Crescent of Sound. I don't know how many of you have seen it. There are probably three or four places in the UK that have it. It's a, it's a series of loudspeakers in, in a semicircle. It doesn't have any accurate, any, any special specialization technique. Sound can play from one or another loudspeaker. Anyway, um, and it is used also for other types of assessments. But this specific test works in this way. Uh, you first do a threshold. Um, measurement, adaptive threshold, where you understand at which level, uh, at which signal to noise level, uh, you understand 50% of uh, the words. And then at that threshold level, you perform the test. The test works that uh, there are two words that are being said 
by two different loudspeakers. Uh, the second loudspeaker is either on the left or on the right of the first. And the person needs to recognize the two words by clicking them on, a, on, a, on, a, on an interface like this, and then needs to say whether the second word was on the left or on the right of the first. So this is a sort of dual task because it aims at measuring um, both the, 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 the speech reception capability and also the spatial release for masking, because the noise, for example, could come from the left or from the right or from both sides, and the speech can come from any position of the loudspeaker. And it also measures um, our localization ability to a certain extent, so how much we can discriminate between two adjacent loudspeaker at threshold. Uh, the test that we have done is try to validate this uh, with uh, um, the test that was done. We'll, we'll try to create a virtual reality version of this where you didn't have to rely on the expensive loudspeaker setup, but you could uh, use. Well, this was evaluated on in an audio only with a, with a simple interface, but now we actually have an Oculus version of this where you actually see the environment with the loudspeakers and on top of it, you see the interface. But what we try to do is we try to validate it and to try to compare the results of our test in virtual reality with the results of the test in real life. And here we can see uh, some of the validation bits. So here you can see in blue is our data and uh, in gray is the data from the publication of Jenny Beasley uh, in the past. So if we look at the relative localization, uh, apart for this uh, unusual uh, drop in the Beasley uh, data, which wasn't really explainable in the paper, we have a similar shape where our localization accuracy, accuracy, the percentage of correct answers decreases on the side, which is expected. Uh, we know that we are more precise to localize sources on the front, and this is understandable also thinking about the, the bigger internal differences from sources located on the front compared to just on the side. And this is uh, comparable with, in this case, we had the, the noise in the same hemisphere and the noise in the opposite hemisphere. These are the two differences. Looking at the speech, actually, here we can see something different. So as expected, we can see that our um, hearing system performs better when the, the speech is on the side because of the better ear effect. In this case, our results was slightly different from the one of Hanud, mainly because uh, of some differences in the calibration and, uh, and in the overall level, and also for to some potential issues on, on, on the binaural version uh, in terms of um, well, in this case, we had some problems with the with the with the HRTF and the and the ITD that we used in the virtual test. But in general, the shape of the recording, especially of the of the results, especially uh, for uh, the noise on the opposite hemisphere, is comparable. While when the noise is on the um, other hemisphere, it's it's um, uh, different. Uh, actually, sorry, apologies. In this case, our data. I, I forgot about this. But there is one thing, our data in, in, in our test, in this case, we didn't test in the virtual test, we didn't test uh, the same hemisphere and the opposite hemisphere, but we just tested the noise as coming from all both sides. And this is why actually we have exactly the same curve left to right, while the Hanud data is different. Apologies, I forgot about this because we have just redone uh, this experiment where we tested also the same side and opposite side. So yeah, the in terms of speech and word discrimination, it is a bit difficult to compare the two results, but we get what we would expect. Again, better performance on the side and uh, a lower performances when the speech is on the front. Um, so this is very promising and very interesting. Again, we carried out the test with an Oculus Quest and with a calibrated set of headphones in a controlled space. We could see this test as being useful, potentially uh, giving it to someone. And we have actually done this uh, in, uh, in another project that I'm going to quickly talk about now. So someone at home could carry out the assessment by themselves. Obviously, you can see what is the potential, what are the potential issues of doing this. It is very appealing, the idea that you could give a device and they can perform the test as many times as they want. The problems are related mainly with well, how controllable is the, 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 the whole test in the sense that they might, for example, well, if you give them the device and the headphones, at least they could be calibrated. But if you release this, for example, as a mobile phone app, then different mobile phones will have different amplification level, different transfer function in terms of, of the frequency response and the matching between the headphones they use and the phone would be different. Furthermore, uh, there will be differences in where they carry out the test. So if they carry it out in a noisy room or in a silent room and etc. So these inconsistencies make this specific test and this specific approach not ideal 
if what we're looking is an absolute measurement, an absolute assessment, like a clinical assessment. In fact, these are not really clinical devices. But it could become useful is what we're looking at is monitoring hearing functions. So uh, if we are not looking at an absolute measurement, but we can have a benchmark measurement at the beginning, for example, done in the clinic, and then ask the person to repeat the test several times during the, the different weeks we want to observe this, and to do this, uh, trying to maintain the, 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 the conditions consistent. So try to do the test, hopefully at the same time of the day, in the same room, in the same position, with the same headphones. And if we do this, then we can use the, 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 this device as a monitoring device, as a hearing monitoring device. And this is where we are, what we are doing currently in this project called Varot, which is funded by RNID, which was Action on Hearing Loss and the Cystic Fibrosis Trust. So what we're doing here is trying to actually, I, I'll play the video that, that gives a short introduction to this test, to this um, um, project. Lorenzo, we're not getting any audio from, oh. the, from the video. I'm sorry. So, sorry, I was hearing it myself. <laughs> uh, give me one second. I'll I'll try again. Yeah, we share with. Share sorry. Yeah, let me give me one second. I'll try again. <coughs> Computer sound. This should be fine. Window. Sorry, these are annoying things. Nice. Yeah. Presenters view. OK, this should be fine now. If I share it with sound window. And this. OK, can you hear some sound now? Sadly not. Oh, OK, then I, I'll remove my headphones and do it like this. Probably OK. OK. Can we monitor the hearing functions of cystic fibrosis patients using a virtual reality app? In certain cases, cystic fibrosis patients might need to take antibiotics, which can have a negative side effects on their hearing, resulting in permanent hearing loss. Monitoring their hearing functions during the therapy is therefore essential. But can this be done using a VR based app? which is designed to be more revealing and engaging than a standard hearing test and can be run autonomously from home. This project is funded by the Cystic Fibrosis Trust and the Royal National Institute of Deaf People and builds on ongoing research in VR-based hearing assessment and training. As you can see from these images and videos, we're now co-designing the application with clinicians and patients and will soon be start assessing its effectiveness within clinical settings. If you're interested to know more or want to be involved in the project, please contact us. OK, cool. I hope I hope you could now he listen to the, the audio that was coming out of my last speaker. It's not great, but yeah. Anyway, so this is a project we are doing now uh, using virtual reality at home. So we, the, 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 the people take at home their device and the headphones, which we have calibrated. But at the same time, they, they, they perform the test in uncalibrated environments. And we are hoping for this to be able to monitor their uh, their hearing functions while they're taking autotoxic medicines. Um, looking again at, at virtual reality as a way to uh, to assess hearing functions, there is another project that we are looking at now, and this starts from uh, um, a strong opinion that I have when talking about spatial audio and how we assess spatial audio. Uh, let's say that the gold standard of spatial audio assessment, perceptual assessment, is a localization test. And normally localization tests would be done by keeping your head still, listening to a sound, generally a noise burst ch -ch -ch, in a position, and then pointing where you think uh, the sound is coming from. This is pretty standard. And the measures are standardized, so you can compare your, 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 your outputs with the outputs of other research. Now, I've often been thinking, how, how, when do we need to carry out this measure? in real life? When do we need to carry out a similar task in real life? When do we ever need to precisely localize a sound source around us without relying on vision and without being able to move our head? 
And I couldn't think about a single case where this is something we need to do in real life, which is very important. I mean, in real life, we might need to detect a car. Car is coming from the left. I turn my head and then I look at the car. At that point, I don't need to precisely locate the car because I can see it. Uh, similar for other noises, as soon as, 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 the, as the source becomes comes in my field of vision, I don't need to look to use sound anymore. And anyway, nearly never I need to localize sound keeping my head still. The problem here is that this is a task where no one in real life is used to perform, that no one in real life is used to perform. Therefore, it becomes very, um, uh, very specialistic task where people that do this often become much better than people that never do it. Therefore, uh, people that leave, that do their research in a lab like ours and, and like yours, will probably be trained to perform this task and perform significantly better than naive listeners and perform significantly better independently on what you are trying to measure, whether it is HRTF fit or not, or whether there are certain differences in the simulated environment. Lab rats like ourselves perform better. And this is problematic because you end up having a test that you carry out only on expert listeners, but then it's difficult to generalize. Is this something really that you can observe in naive listeners or in people that are not used to this test? So this is just to introduce the fact that I, we've been trying now to, to find other tests that are sensitive to the small measures we're looking when, when talking about specialization. For example, uh, again, different HRTFs. Uh, non-individualized HRTF, slight um, um, alterations of the spectral cues or of the interaural cues or of the environment, the, 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 the reverb. So we want to design some tests that are a bit more ecologically valid, therefore they're more related to what we do in everyday life, so people would be more used to them, and therefore you might find less differences between expert listeners and non-expert listeners. And at the same time, that will allow us to measure what we're looking at. So this is a project we currently have with uh, uh, UCL, is actually funded by Oticon, so the, the Ericsson Center, so we work with them together. And in this case, we are looking at, let's say, non-target hearing. So most of our tests, uh, focus localization tests, focus on target hearing. So we say, this is a target, tell me where the target is. But what about what, the rest of the soundscape? Generally silent, but we might do some tests in noise, for example. So in this case, what we're looking at is how do we perceive, in terms of spatial and location, whatever is not in our target area or our target, both in terms of, of, of uh, let's say, cognitive auditory perception. So we are performing a task and there are sounds that happen around us. Can we use something about these sounds? Can we change something in this sound and see a change in the response of the listener that would be potentially sensitive to what we're looking at? So in this case, we are creating different setups. The first setup that we're creating is this large, um, well, it's 32 loudspeaker setup that we have put uh, in our White City campus here at Imperial. And, and at the beginning, we are trying to look at tests such as uh, mismatch negativity, which was a test that I wasn't at all uh, familiar with. Um, the team at UCL uh, is led by Maria Chait, and she is the one bringing expertise in this field. The idea there, uh, from what I understand, is that you you have a test where you are you, you have an EEG headset on, so we're measuring EEG, and you are performing a task, could be playing a video game, could be doing something, and something in the periphery is happening, like a sound is repeated in a certain uh, pitch or something. And then at a certain point, this uh, repeated sound changes, and when this changes, even if it's not in your field of vision or in your attention field, then you would see something in the EEG signal that varies. Uh, so our question is, most of these tests, actually all these tests have been carried out without proper acoustics and in, in spatial simulation. So they're generally mono, maybe left or right maximum. So what we're looking at is, can we potentially see something in EEG when we change something more subtle about, for example, the, the position of the sound of this 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 repeated sound or the distance or the way we render it, for example. And this is what we are trying to explore now. We're trying first with a large loudspeaker array, then moving to a smaller one, more portable, and then possibly to binaural. Again, we just started, so we don't have any output on this. But um, another interesting area. So now let's have to move away from using virtual reality to assess hearing, and let's look at hearing training. And this is, I think, a very powerful, very an area that has got a lot of potential for the future. So we know that our brain has a certain amount of plasticity. This is generally higher for younger people, but we can uh, learn 
uh, new perceptual skills and we can help our brain to remap some of their perceptual skills. I mean, we, we probably are all familiar with some of the early tests done, I think, at the beginning of the last century where people put, I don't know, plasticine or little pipes in their ear to make their head virtually bigger. And uh, at the beginning, they were not able to localize sources with that accurately, but then with time, they were able to remap some of the uh, localization cues or and, and all their, 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 the way these were analyzed by their brain and learn to localize sources even with the altered cues. And nowadays we are talking about head related transfer functions. So we know about the head related transfer function that is generally individual. There are many components that are related with the shape of our ears, of our shoulders, of our head. And what we have often been asking is, can I use reliably a non-individual head related transfer function? So some measure for someone else. For me, for example, can I use it? And can I, for example, learn how to localize sources with that? The same principle, except that instead of using plasticine, we just use uh, we just use a different HRTF for the virtual simulation. And again, in this case, virtual reality is very useful because it allows us to do these simulations and actually to add visuals. So in this case, we carried out a test, a study, where we had a sort of a shooter game. Um, uh, and we had, uh, well, this was the signal that we used. It was a sort of a speech-like uh, signal. And we did several training sessions and several uh, testing sessions. So training, testing, training, testing across three different days to see if people could improve their localization skills using an HRTF that was in their own. And in this case, we can see, well, the green one is the control group and that the other ones are several different um, trained group. We try different options, for example, gamification, so gamifying the training, making it more interesting or making it interactive with head rotations and etc. So we can see here that there is a significant improvement at the beginning. Uh, this we generally refer to this as a, a um, procedural training, so people learn how to do the task, they learn how to play the game. But what we're interested in is to see can they actually learn how, can they actually learn and acquire a new perceptual task? In this case, uh, can they learn to localize sources with a different HRTF? So we look at what happens after, and we can see that the control group didn't improve significantly what the other groups did after a certain number of training sessions. Specifically, in this case, nine, the training session lasted only 12 minutes. So indeed, we can improve our localization accuracy with a non-individual HRTF or with altered spatial cues with time. Actually, specifically looking at the lateral error, what we're doing now, we have a PhD student, again, funded by Otikon, and we're looking at how we can adapt to highly altered interoral cues, specifically ITD and ILD. Uh, we know, for example, that having over uh, a very large ILD can improve speech perception in noise just because of, of the better ear effort and the fact that we would have bigger differences between the two years. But what we don't know is how fast we could adapt to localize sound sources with this. So this is something we are exploring again. And, and looking at this concept of training, there is a project that we're doing where we are extending this beyond HRTFs. So if we can actually learn to use different spatial cues, such as the ones that come from an HRTF that is not ours, could we learn to, learn to, to, to use very much more altered cues, such as the one that a cochlear implant user hears? So uh, I suspect we are all familiar with what a cochlear implant is, so I don't need to repeat this, but if there is, if, if I need, then let me know. But effectively, it is a, a digital ear that takes the place of our peripheral hearing system and, uh, and uh, connects directly to our cochlea and to the auditory nerve, uh, sending impulses there. And uh, obviously, the audio from a cochlear implant is very, very, very altered compared to, to what we would experience in real life. And this is probably one of the reasons why cochlear implants are more successful with children that I've never heard before, rather than with adults that have had a normal hearing life. And then at a certain point, they need to hear this terrible signal. Uh, but um, recently in the UK, uh, they've started implanting cochlear implants in children bilaterally. In the past, they used to do one ear only. Now it is standard to do them both ears. Now, the problem here comes from the fact that, A, generally, they're, I mean, often they're not done in the same session, so they're done at different months apart. And B, there are many, many reasons why the two implants are not working in the same way. The main one is insertion depth, the, the, the set of, of, of um, um, electrodes are inserted in the cochlea, which is 
two, two and a half centimeters long. There are 22, 23 electrodes of which at the end, probably half of them are going to work, but they might be inserted a bit more, a bit less. So there might be mismatch in terms of pitch between the two ears. There are definitely mismatch in terms of level and potentially also in terms of temporal resolution, even though with cochlear implants, temporal resolution is, as we know, very problematic anyway. So the idea here is having such a such a an altered set of spatial cues, can we use virtual reality to, to train this teenage cochlear implant users in order to use their both of their ears to perform their task? And I say both of their ears because having observed and discussed with many of them in the past, you can see that they start putting in place coping mechanisms. For example, they might have a ear that has been in, that had been uh, surgically installed earlier and they tend to use that for speech. And then the later one, they might use it for music. And at times I've seen them switching off one, uh, for example, the speech one in order to listen to music because then we're used to that. But they rarely rely on both implants together to get, uh, well, to do certain tasks. They generally rely on one only, maybe one or the other, depending on their preference and on how long they had it and how much they trained for it. So they lose a lot of the advantages that we have by using two years, by using the interaural differences and other spectral cues. So the BEARS project looks precisely at this. There are several partners, it's been funded by the NIHR. And, uh, and what we're trying to do is to use virtual reality application, in this case, real virtual reality. So we have head mounted displays and, and immersive audio, and to try to uh, encourage and, 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 and train um, children to use both ears in several tasks. Specifically, we're looking at three tasks. One is speech and noise. The other one is localization and target shooting. And the third one is music. So each of these tasks need to be performed using uh, both ears, can only be performed using both ears. At the beginning, they have the visual aspect to help them. For example, in the target, they can see the target and then shoot it. And slowly, the target will disappear. So they will need to rely only on the auditory side. So here I have a short video of the gameplay. Well, it's not really short, so I'll start playing it a bit now. But I'll probably stop before the end because it's a bit long. But I hope you can hear. Hello. So this is a short demonstration of the Bears hearing training application suite. Uh, this is the main uh, menu. Well, here I'm using my account. Lorenzo I can actually switch user and create different accounts with different settings. And here I have uh, uh, different options. Uh, here I can select the overall volume, the playing height, the head size to, to, to uh, adapt the audio rendering. I can switch users and then I can go into the play area. Now in the play area, I have my three main applications. One is related with music training, one with spatial training, which is localization, target, and one is with speech. So we can maybe have a look, uh, for example, at the speech task. Now here there are lessons. Now I've done the first lesson in order to activate the other uh, options, but the first lesson is basically a, a tutorial, a guide through to the task. Uh, we can then go into the first challenge, the first shift. And let's have a look at how this looks like. So uh, here it tells me what stars I can win depending on the on the points I make, and I can start playing. So I'm in a diner, and I have people coming around. Hi, can I can order something, please? So this asks for the order. I yes. like an apple. I select the order, and then I can pick up the apple and put it. There. Thank you. Great, and I get my bonus. And there's going to be someone else hopefully hey, coming over up over here. Here we go. I need to first identify who gave the order. I need to I like the tea, Then I need to choose whatever they ask me, and then give. Sorry, me. but I didn't order this. Oh, I've selected Why coffee. Why is it taking so long? Okay, so we don't need to watch it all. It's actually on YouTube. I can send you a link, uh, but it shows also the other apps. But you can see that there is in each of these elements. There is in each of these games. There is an element, an important element related with both ears. First, you need to localize who's speaking, then you need to ask their order. And the more you go forward, the more people are going to come around, then you're going to get more background noise, then you're going to get more complex requests, not just one item, but multiple items. We're now looking at a pizza game where you need to put together different ingredients. I'm horrified by the fact that, they, that one of the ingredients is pineapple and pizza. I fought against that, but unfortunately, that's what's going to happen. Uh, but yes, yeah, so this is the type of game. So the idea of this project is that it's going to go into clinical trials soon. So in January, we'll start the clinical trials, which will run for three years. We'll involve a few hundred uh, teenage cochlear implant users who are going to um, use this application at home for three months. Uh, in these three months, we will carry out a series of 
uh, interim assessments, some in the clinic and some that they do alone, for example, the spatial speech and noise. And plus, we'll also look at several other metrics, such as quality of life and other questionnaires that are being developed specifically for this. And I do actually think that the, the hearing training aspect uh, has a big potential. Uh, in this case, yeah, we can look at this, at this as, a, as a sort of a, a lot of the research we have done in the past has been looking at system to user adaptation, adapting the system, the device we did, we, we developed to the user. Well, the user to system adaptation is also very interesting and has a lot of potential. Potentially, we can achieve very big improvements by doing proper training that are similar to the improvements you can potentially get by using a hearing aid. And they're not exclusive in the sense that you could do both. You could still use the hearing aid, which is very successful, and at the same time use uh, some training. So we have other projects looking at this. In this case, we're looking at uh, VR to train monolateral spatial listening skills. This is a collaboration with the University of Trento. So in this case, we're simulating in virtual reality. Again, another thing that virtual reality can help with. We can simulate a hearing loss, for example, a monolateral one, and try to see how fast people can recover the localization uh, skills and what are the best uh, procedures and cues to give them in order for this to happen. And there is also a company, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an advisor on their board, but I'm not really directly involved, that is called Eogym, that is now looking specifically at this. It's a very interesting approach that I would very much, I, I think is very fascinating from an academic perspective and potentially very powerful. So looking at future challenges in this domain, we have looked at hearing assessment, we have looked at hearing training and some projects that have been done there. And uh, I've, we've actually involved the, the, the VCCA community uh, for the presentation that I did before, uh, the, um, the computational audiology community, the, the presentation I did before the summer. We've involved uh, the participants in trying to identify what are, in their opinion, the future challenges with VR applied to hearing research. And this is a list of individual items that they have uh, pointed out that they have reported. And then we have engaged with the people that reported these items to cluster them. And we have created four separate categories and clusters. So the first one is related with applications and the use in clinical settings. So how do how could we use it in real life uh, beyond what happens in the lab? And how can we, um, yeah, what do we need to do in order to improve uptake in clinical settings? And this is related to the next one, which is hardware and software. So we need more tools. We need actually more standardized tools that can be used by multiple people at the same time uh, and obtain results which can be comparable. And this is related to the third challenge, which is, again, validation and standardization. We need more studies where uh, standard audiology tests are repeated in virtual reality and validated. Uh, uh, in a way so that we can quantify what are the differences and beware that if we use, for example, a virtual reality test, we can expect this or that, and also quantify how much we can actually use it in clinical settings. And finally, this is more related to the actual rendering side of thing. Can we improve the realism and control of our uh, applications? So when we try to make them more realistic, maybe also from the visual point of view, a big issue is, for example, lip reading with a virtual character is very difficult to do that. And uh, most of all, when we do work in this domain, we don't, we're not graphic developers, so it's difficult to do that. So often we use films and recorded uh, scenes, but this is potentially problematic in terms of the interactivity and the, and the, and the flexibility of these recordings. So there is a, a lot to do there also from the auditory perspective, how realistic we can do the, 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 the audio rendering and etc. If you want, actually, there is a full, uh, this is a QR code, I can send you later the link, uh, but there is the full report uh, over uh, this exercise that is publicly available on Well Sorted. So you can just uh, look at all the description of these topics and items. And finally, to close, just quickly to say that all this work that we have done, we have done it using our own spatializer tool, the 3D tuning toolkit, which is actually open source and available. Now we actually have also a few new versions and additions. It is a binaural spatializer. It is implemented mainly in C++ as a core, but it has many different releases, as you'll see later. It has a hearing loss simulator, which has also, for example, the Baron Moore um, frequencies mirroring algorithm is integrated as well. It has a basic hearing aid simulator, and uh, it works in real time, multi-platform, C++. There is also JavaScript wrapper for web base. There is now a Unity wrapper, which is very stable and we released it, and also a VST plugin, uh, both a VST plugin of the whole 
toolkit and of individual elements. So just specialization, binaural reverb, uh, hearing loss simulator and hearing aid simulator. And it's open source. Now, um, I think this is the end of my initial presentation, but I just took much more than, than, than expected. So here I had a, just a short list of the other things we do, and I can just quickly mention them and then we can go to the last page with the pictures of the members of the team. But quickly, uh, the work, other work we do uh, at the moment, uh, one big project we have at the moment that is related to this Sonicum research project we are involved in, I'll tell you more later, looks at, again, individualization of HRTF, but in this case, looks at a slightly different approach. So. We have actually recently published a paper on this on the frontiers in signal processing. Um, what if we could have an individualized HRTF that though has got a relatively low quality and maybe is measured only for a few positions? Can we use machine learning to upsample this HRTF and improve its quality? So can we train? In this case, we use generative, a generative adversarial network and in specific, we use SR GAN, so it's super resolution GANs. And we train them on a large number of HRTFs. Uh, actually, we train them on measured HRTF, but we also try to explore sort of transfer learning using um, um, synthesized HRTF, so low quality HRTF. And we then took another HRTF we didn't train for and uh, uh, reduced the number of positions up down to five single positions. So uh, there was one front, back, left, right, and up. And then we use the GAN to oversample this. And the results are very interesting. Uh, we compared the results with uh, standard interpolation techniques like barycentric, linear, or VBAP interpolation techniques. And while these outperform the GAN, ap GAN approach when you have, uh, for example, H 80 HRTF positions available, when you have very few, like three, four, or five, the GAN approach outperforms by far the barycentric interpolation. We still need to look at this a bit more, but it's very promising because it could be that you could measure your HRTF at home using just a loudspeaker, two microphone, maybe three or four positions in a room that is not calibrated and then use the GAN to upsample and improve the quality of your HRTF. Uh, we're also looking at perceptual models in this case for selecting the best fitting HRTF from a data set of non-individual ones. So in this case, if you don't have your own, could you take a data set and then uh, use a perceptual computational model to select a subset of these that could be best suited to you? And uh, then we're looking at uh, HRTF and spatial release for masking uh, related specifically at how much HRTF individualization is of importance when um, trying to assess spatial release for masking. So our ability to understand speech when the masker and the target are separated spatially. So we're looking at how much, yeah, the, the, the HRTF choice can have an effect in this. And then we're also doing a study, some studies on binaural reverberation. In this case, specifically looking at how much we can approximate the reverberation for it still to be plausible and realistic enough for, in this case, specifically augmented reality scenarios. We're working on uh, uh, adaptation to uh, altered interaural cues. As mentioned before, this is a collaboration with uh, Articon. So when we alter interaural cues, how can we adapt to those? And then we have all our projects that are related to the acoustic monitoring. I mentioned at the beginning of our device for recording. This is more on, on the soundscape work we're doing in acoustic. And we actually now developed a device that has got six microphones. So we are also doing some beamforming and we, we have a few of these devices in Borneo at the moment recording audio and we try to use the output of them to uh, have estimates of biodiversities, do species count, track species when they move and in general try to measure, have a metric to measure the the healthiness of, of uh, the, the ecosystem and the forest. So these first projects are all related with this Sonicum EU funded project. You can find more information on the website. I can give it to you. This is Oticon, and then this is a, a, what we say a safe acoustic project, which is this larger project that we are doing on ecoacoustic monitoring. So I finish it here and I just leave you with uh, um, uh, this slide which is the research team and the different people and funders and friends that have contributed to all this research. And I think, yeah, it can be done. And, and if you have any question, I'll be very happy to answer. Thank you very much, Lorenzo.